Transportation Government Operations Committee. This is Thursday, May 4th, and we are going to get started. And apologies, we are a little late. We have a long floor session and then a press conference. So we are getting started now with um, some testimony on the charter change for the town of Brattleboro. And we have two, um, for, a former and a current student at Brattleboro Union High School who are going to talk with us um, today. Um, good afternoon, Lillian and Django. Wait, did I say your name right? Django, is that correct? Uh, Django, okay. you, just, you don't say Django. the D, thank you. The D is silent. Okay, thank you. We are going to introduce ourselves to you <clears throat> since you haven't been in our committee yet. And then, um, Lily, you're the first up. We'll just turn it over to you. You can introduce yourself. And um, then we'll, uh, we'd love to hear what you have to say about the charter change. I'm Senator Ruth Hardy. I represent the Addison District and am chair of the GovOps Committee. I'm Olivia Parker, Committee Assistant. Uh, and I'm Senator Rebecca White from Windsor County District. Bob, just in time, go ahead. Hi, Senator Bob Norris, Franklin District. Ann Watson, Washington District. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County District. And this is um, Senator Tanya Bihoski who will be joining us um, soon. So apologies that we're eating while we're while we're doing this. We missed lunch. So um, uh, Lily, if you want to introduce yourself, who you are, where you're from, and what you how you're uh, related to this proposed charter change. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, my name is Lily Buren, and I'm a freshman at Middlebury College, but I'm a Brattleboro resident and constituent. I also would like to say that I am a former page, so I'm very sad that I'm not at the state house right now. Yeah. <laughs> Um, anyway, prior to coming to Middlebury, I was very involved in Bradbury Town politics as a young person. Last year, I served as the temporary chair of the Bradbury Democratic Party and worked throughout high school on various political issues that held special importance to me, including in 2021, testifying in support of S30, a bill proposing to ban firearms at hospitals, government buildings, and child care facilities. In 2021, I was 17 years old. At 17, I was old enough to testify on a state bill, but I was not old enough to vote in my own town election. In 2022, I attended a national committee hosted virtually by the League of Women Voters to advocate for lowering the voting age nationwide. I want to assure you that I am not advocating for that today, but at the time I was freshly 18. But And the point still stands that I was politically aware young person using my voice to make a change in any way that I could. I was not involved in the original efforts to pass the Bradbury Youth Vote beyond attending one meeting in the back of the Brooks Memorial Library at age 12, where I listened to a group of slightly older teenagers draft the beginnings of the town charter. The town charter passed in Brattleboro on March 5th, 2019. The charter passed with 69% support four years after losing 42 to 58% in 2015. A week before the governor vetoed the bill in 2022, I rallied 300 students and members of the community to send messages to the governor explaining why they believed he should sign the bill. Even after he vetoed the bill, I continue to write to legislators in hopes of overturning the veto. On March 11th, I traveled to the State House to celebrate the House's vote to overturn the veto. This marked the 11th time the House had overturned a governor's veto in Vermont history. And while I, while I was discouraged to see that the Senate voted to support the governor's mm -hmm. veto, I do not think it should hinder young people from fighting for their right to vote. Lowering the town voting age can lead to a long-term increase in voter turnout and push citizens to be more aware of the role government at a younger age. Furthermore, 16 and 17 year olds have the necessary civic knowledge to vote independently and responsibly. Youth are directly affected by local political, political issues as much as anyone else and should have a say in the workings of their local government. Starting at 16, youth can work without a limit on hours pay taxes on their income, operate a vehicle, and even be tried as an adult in court. Lowering the voting age would empower young voters to listen and address the concerns of their youth constituents and encourage long-term civic engagement. I also brought the turnout in our annual town meetings during 2020, 2022, 
and 2023 of showing how it has changed in recent years as a result of COVID. Um, I will send you these later so they can be on file. In 2020, District 1 had a 38.5 voter turnout. In District 2, there was a 38% district turnout. And District 3, there was a 39% district turnout with an overall district turnout of 39%. And then after COVID, this drastically dropped with 2020 being 13% in District 1, 15% in District 2, 13% in District 3, I mean, 15% in District 3, and 14 overall percent for all three districts. And then in 2023, the voting turnout did increase a little bit with District 1 having 20%, District 2 having 20%, District 3 having 25%, and an overall district turnout of 22%. This indicates that while youth, um, while vote tur voter turnout has improved since COVID, it still has is lower than before COVID. And how this relates to youth voting, in my opinion, is that it is not a secret that young families have started flocking to Vermont since COVID in hopes of seeking a sense of outdoor adventure and or a better quality of life. See US News and World Report, Vermont Public, Vermont Digger, and Seven Days. And I believe that if the town charter were to pass, our voting turnout numbers would continue to go up and it would continue to encourage you young families to move to Brattleboro and the larger state overall. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. That was really helpful. And kudos to you for all of the work you put into this. Um, and it, does anyone have any questions for Lily mm -hmm. at the moment? Senator White? Uh, thank you, Chair Hardy. Lily, thank you so much for um, your continued perseverance on this. Um, uh, one of the things that I've heard often as a, uh, a concern about young folks voting um, is the idea that they are not mentally capable of making these decisions. And I'm wondering if in your work or research, you um, have seen any science or anything that has been compelling uh, in, on that front? Because we did hear something around that when it comes to um, like vaping and brain development. So I'm wondering if there was anything that you came across as you've been working on this. I have not come across any research directly related to vo youth voting. However, I would like to point out that 18 year olds and 17 year olds are tasked with the responsibility of choosing whether or not to go to college and or handle those financial decisions. And I think that points to youth being way more aware and able to make these life altering decisions, especially since that is something that obviously fairly, but very stressfully is thrown on students as young people. Um, and I think that indicates a level of maturity that is important to note because students are faced with these life altering decisions during this time period between age 16 and 18. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Are there any other questions at the moment for Lily? Okay. Django, do you want to um, introduce yourself and um, tell us what you would like to hear, uh, us to hear? <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Django Grace. I live in Brattleboro, Vermont. I have my whole life. I'm a junior right now at Brattleboro Union High School. Um, yeah, aside from yeah, that, sure. sorry, it's probably gonna be pretty loud. We're in passing time and I'm uh, in a printer room, uh, but um, yeah. <laughs> aside from, you know, uh, being in school, I'm on the lacrosse team here and I like to ski a lot and I'm in a lot of uh, Brattleboro and I also serve on the town energy committee for Brattleboro and work really closely with our um, sustainability <laughs> Stephen Dawson. Um, the youth vote, mainly for me, um, I think it would really serve to to kind of bridge a gap that Brad was facing right now. Um, you know, I haven't been in a lot of other communities, so I, I don't really have much to compare it to, but I, I think in our community, especially, there's there's a lot of really motivated young people. We have a very, very strong generation that I'm part of um, that feels very strongly about a lot of issues that our community is facing and that the country is facing. We actually really have no... Um, 
civil way to, you know, like politically, we don't, we have no political power to exercise aside from, you know, peaceful protest and petitioning, which really anybody can do. Um, our, our school especially has been facing this year. We, we faced, um, last year, we actually had two um, shooter threats. Um, we had, we've been having a pretty severe drug problem at our school. Um, we had two overdoses <laughs> in the span of a week um, in, in our, in our school community. And, and this is stuff, this is stuff that's not only in the UHS. Like, I like to think that like, like schools are kind of a microcosm of what's going on in the greater community. And so as a result of all these problems, I mean, we have, we have a generation of people who's really willing to, you know, stand up and, and really opinionated, but they actually, we don't, we don't really have a way to do that. Um, to, um, change. No. And oh. so, you know, as a person who, you know, serves on, excuse me. I'm sorry, you you cut out for just a second, um, but you're back. Go ahead. Okay, I'm back. Yeah. Um, good. good. And one thing that at, at the last time I testified, uh, Mr. Ian Goodnow, um, sorry, uh, Ian Goodnow said something that really resonated with me. And, and um, it, it's a really good point that, you know, a lot of a lot of young people are actually also supporting the Brattleboro workforce right now. You know, I have friends who work in pretty much any restaurant or, you know, little store you go into and Brattleboro is going to have a high school or working at it um, for, for, for a good amount of hours, you know, 16 year olds, um, we're already being taxed if we're working, we can operate a motor vehicle and we're also making huge financial decisions right now. Like we're like, I personally am looking at colleges right now and that is a huge fiscal decision that's going to be reflecting the rest of your life. So, um, I think, I think it is important that there, there's a lot of argument against, you know, young people being, being able to make decisions about taxes or vote on those sort of um, economic issues when we, in reality we are making a lot of big economic decisions ourselves. Um, so yeah, I, and, and my, the final thing I'd like to say is that like, if you want a community that's gonna, you know, have a young generation, like if you want a young generation in a community to trust the people running the community, the community has to trust the young people. Um, and I think that that's how we're gonna bridge the gap. And I think that's how we're gonna develop a lot of action in our community and make it a Brad Road place that people really wanna live in. And I hope we can be uh, an example once we pass the charter to the rest of the state and hopefully to the rest of the country. Thank you. Thank you, Django. Um, I, I have a question for both of you. One of the issues that came up the last time we dealt with this bill <clears throat> was um, the question of whether or not uh, 16 and 17 year olds were ready and able to actually not just vote, but uh, serve as a member of your select board or your uh, in local office. Do you feel that you or your peers are ready to take on that responsibility? Is there a desire in the community for, among your peers to run for office? And if so, how do you think they would handle that? Lily, do you want to weigh in on that first? Yeah, I would love to. So I graduated from BHS last year. And as a senior, I remember seeing a lot of the freshmen and sophomore students faced with a lot of anxiety as they returned to a high school community, especially as many of them missed either half, half or all of their middle school experience. And I think that that led to a lot of students feeling as though they don't have any say or any power when it came to our education systems and the administrative voice in general. We also did end up having our principal um, leave at the end of last year for some unpleasant uh, circumstances. And I think that it created a lot of mental instability in the student body as they felt that they really didn't have much of a say or voice when it came to what was happening, when it directly affected them the most. Um, and I think many of these stressors are things that adults aren't really aware of because unlike us, you guys have experience, well, hopefully all of high school and middle school and elementary school without a pandemic and or other outside factors. And I think 
that while adults are really aware that we are still recovering from the pandemic, they're not fully aware of how it directly affected those students' mental health, missing those really important years for learning, but also community building. Um, and so I think that if students were given the opportunity to serve on a board and say their views and opinions, it would really help adults to understand what is going through these students' heads when you see an increase in overdoses and school fights and a lack of student attendance in classes and overall school in general. Um, so yeah, I do think that whether students or not have the complete capacity to understand all of the legislative and kind of, um, I guess, administrative aspects of student and or education boards in general, they really understand the emotional impact and kind of what the results of these decisions are. And so if students were given a voice, it would encourage an entire student body to feel more safe in their school community overall. Okay, thank you, Lily. Although I do think the bill <clears throat> is just about town government, not yes, school government. Is. But I do think that schools, the students in the schools would probably, like if they were serving, they would discuss most education, which is something that I think is kind of just most necessary for students in general right now in Brattleboro. Does the Brattleboro School Board have student representatives on the school board? Yes, I think. Yes. I could be wrong. I don't okay. actually, I should, I believe so, but yeah. I'm not sure. Yes, it does. Okay. Um, yes, okay. Um, but we, we also have Representative Molly Birkin well, here. Um, let me ask her because she's wanting to weigh in. Ahead. Well, it's complicated because of our unified school district. Mm. So we have... Yeah, and that's why this would not apply to school boards right. because of the unified districts. Right. There are some Brattleboro people on the school board, people from the other towns in the district. But are there are there student members on the board? I'm not. Oh, well, that, that's what I was asking. So, I think. Django, well, and you Django think probably knows better than I do. Yeah, but you think you that there are student members on the board? <clears throat> so. There are no student board members that have any, you know, say like they can't, they're not technically on the board. Like there's no actual like voting power there. Um, there are two and I, they have a title. Um, one of them is like my best friend, but I can't, I can't remember what, what the actual title is, but it is essentially a student representative. Um, and, and they often weigh in. There's two of them, Benberg and Kaya Colby. Um, and they, weigh in on issues and yeah i mean their job is really to represent um they also you know take part in a lot of the training that the school board goes through um they serve as a liaison and they also lead a lot of training um in uh like with a lot of school groups so like that like a school group will say hey we want to have something that the for example we have a group called aware um, this is kind of a tangent, but they, they were to, you know, foster diversity on school campus. So they said, Hey, we want to have, um, we, we want to have a staff training and a school board training. So then the, the two representatives on the school board, Benberg and Kai Colby kind of led a workshop for the, um, school board and a lot of staff and, fa and faculty. So that's kind of like the connection that they bridge, but they actually have any voting power. So ultimately okay. they, yeah. They're kind of advisory, right? Um, okay, um, we have another question from Senator Clarkson. Thank you both for your testimony. Do you have a notion of what percent at the moment of the voting uh, of, of the population in Brattleboro uh, the 16 and 17 year olds represent? Um, it looks like Mr. Good now knows. Um, we'll, we're going to get to your testimony in just a minute. So if you want to um, answer it through your testimony, that'd be great. Um, okay. So do you, you guys have a notion of how many 16 and 17 year olds would be eligible to vote at the moment? I guess the young yeah. people don't. Yeah. You do. Well, Jim does, but you guys don't. We'll, we'll get to him next. I want to make okay. sure we so have they don't. Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah. And the other, um, they would be able to vote on school budgets, wouldn't they? No. no. This is only for town. Only for town. Okay, even though the budget is part of town. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, are there other questions? Um, Senator Norris. Yes. <clears throat> thanks for being here. I appreciate that. 
I was just curious. I, I can only assume that you both support the 16 and 17 old voting in Brattleboro, correct? They're nodding. They're nodding, yeah. They're nodding, okay. <laughs> so <clears throat> I was just wondering where we came up with 16 and 17 year olds only. Uh, if this passes and 14 and 15 year olds approached you and said, hey, we want to vote too. Uh, at what age do you think uh, young adults should be able to start voting and, and why? Uh, Lily, do you want to answer that? Do you have a? Sure. Um, I mean, for me, I think it's very obvious that it should start with 16 and 17 because that's the age that most students <clears throat> enter a workforce and have more adult like roles that they most likely do not have at 14 and 15. Um, I do believe that some 15 year olds can work, but obviously they cannot drive. And um, I don't, I'm not exactly sure how taxing on income works at 15, but I do know it's different than 16. Um, and I just think those are two big indicators that there is a shift because there are some responsibilities that start to fall on students when they get to the age of 16, that is just not in place at 15. Um, I also think that emotionally students who are 16 and 17 start to kind of enter a phase where they really do feel trapped between being a child and adult in a different way than younger students. Obviously it is up to personal experience, but I think that overall 16 and 17 years are more like self-aware and also community aware and they do have more responsibilities than other students, such as driving and tax income and worrying about college and so on. Django, do you want to add anything or? Um, no, that pretty much sums it up for me. Okay, great, great. So, so basically you're saying the two prerequisites are paying taxes and holding a driver's license. I don't think those are the prerequisites, but I think they're strong indicators of mental maturity. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Yeah. Senator White. Uh, thanks, ma'am. <clears throat> uh, I will say this discussion is very close to my heart because I ran for local office when I had just turned 20 um, for the first time. And I was actually my student representative on my school board as a non-voting member when I went to high school. And one of the things that came up quite a bit in my race when I ran as a 20 year old was that I didn't own property. And that the idea that I didn't own property meant that I shouldn't serve on a board. Um, so I do think we have some outdated conceptions about like the role of voting and how folks who are impacted by policies then also need to be contributing to society. Um, so I do think that the holdover we have with some of the age limitations, if a community is defining their young people, 16 and 17 year olds, as mature and able as, as Brattleboro has voted many times to do, I think that that community and cultural maturity that we're ascribing to that age group is more important than the actual age itself. And so I, I really respect that that standard um, that Brattleboro has put forward, they've continued to stand by. And I hope that we as a state don't um, don't limit it because it is culturally, our, how we view age is very culturally specific. Um, for many, a 20 year old was too young to serve in local government because again, I didn't own property. I don't think property ownership is a reason for service or should limit your service. Um, and now as a 28 year old, I'm still too young um, to be in the Senate. So I think it's very culturally defined and I'm extremely pleased to see um, that you, Lily, have continued the fight even as you now can vote um, under the under the way we do it now. And Django, um, I did want to know, I really appreciate the work you've done on your energy committee. I got to work with you when I was at Efficiency Vermont and the idea that you could volunteer and put in hours of time and effort towards uh, a, a position that is affecting the town, but then not be able to vote on, on the implications of the work that you're doing feels a little absurd. Uh, so I appreciate um, both of those, both of you doing that work. Senator Carson. Thanks. I, I guess I'm trying to get a, a, a little bit of understanding of, have you guys done polling with 16 and 17 year olds at the high school to see who who's really jazzed about this issue and who 
who's engaged. I know a few of you have been very engaged, but how have you engaged the rest of the 16 and 17 year old population? And what percent of support do you feel that there is, what degree of interest is there in the rest of the, that age population? So I, I was actually just thinking about this. Um, so this, <laughs> this issue actually arose so many years ago that the original polling was done in a student population that is now out of the high school. Um, and I was speaking with Kurt Dimes who, um, is part of the organization Bradboro Common Sense that was one of the original kind of like founding um, groups in in this um, in the original charter change, which I think was voted at at representative town meeting and, and was bounced around a lot. But it came out of a lot of polling that that organization did um, among young people, what not specifically students, but they wanted to know um, what young people felt were the biggest issues in our community. And the, and the biggest issue for young people then, Kurt told me, like, like overwhelmingly was that simply they just didn't feel like they could do anything. They simply felt like they didn't have a voice in the community. So that was a very overwhelming testimony that they had. Um, and then this charter change, you know, was drafted by students and Brad Rowe Common Sense, and, and then it came together. And I don't know all the history of it, but I know that that is one of the original places it orig originated was a very um, overwhelming response in a student population of BUHS. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Lily, go ahead. Um, I was just trying to find the numbers, but I could not. But last year, I created a Google form that I sent out to students um, primarily, prim primarily through the political science department but or social studies but um but <laughs> i did receive um i can't find the numbers because i cannot get back into my wsasu account but mm -hmm. i remember that when i did speak to different social studies classes about the issue many of the students were really excited and really interested but just had not heard about it before and that when it did come time to organize a mass right to legislators um a majority of the people who did write and reach out to their legislators were students um i can't find the numbers but i do think it was over at least a hundred maybe 100. so again i can't give you exact numbers but i do think when students are informed and kind of told about what this issue and how it would affect them they really are excited and want to see it pass. Great. Thanks, Lily and Django. Um, I think we're going to move on now to um, Ian Goodnow um, and have him testify. But we really appreciate all of the work you've done to get this charter change where it's at and to continue the, the momentum for it, even though many of the original students are, are now well over the age that they can vote and have maybe moved on. So thank you for continuing to be active in this issue. Thank you all. Take care. You're welcome to stay with us, Lily, if you want, um, uh, as, as Ian does his testimony. Um, Ian, I don't know if you were on when we all introduced ourselves. Did you hear our introductions? I was not, and I apologize for being a moment, a, a couple minutes late. I had it on for uh. No, you're fine. Um, we we were late also because we were on the floor for a long time. So so we're we're running a little behind, but we should be we should be okay. I'm Senator Ruth Hardy from the Addison District and chair of the committee. Uh, Olivia Parker, committee. Senator Tanya Vihovsky, Chittenden Central. Senator Bob Norris, Franklin District. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County District. Great. Um, Ian, why don't you just introduce yourself and um, let us know your thoughts on this charter change as the uh, your, leave your chair of the select board. Absolutely. So yeah, my name is Ian Goodnow. Uh, I am the chair of the Brattleboro Select Board. Uh, I'm here to speak to you in that capacity as a representative, the representative of the municipal government of Brattleboro, and also as a resident uh, of the town uh, to speak in favor of H386. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank the committee for taking the time uh, to hear my testimony and also to reconsider um, this very important initiative that's been brought before you by the voters of Brattleboro. 
Um, this is very important to us. And um, as I'll speak to, um, the, a majority of Brattleboro residents want this. And I really hope that you can help bring it forward so that it can become a reality here in our town. So uh, I'm uh, gonna just give a brief history and I apologize if that um, has already been testified to, but I want to uh, really ground this in why we're here, which is about Brattleboro's vote. Um, so on August 20th of 2018, uh, the petition for a youth vote was submitted uh, to the Brattleboro town clerk. It contained more than the required 449 signatures of the a valid Brattleboro residents. That's for 5% of the total voter mm -hmm. checklist. Um, there were more than 449, but we stopped counting once you hit the valid number. Um, then on March 5th of 2019, Rattleboro voted in favor of the youth vote charter change with uh, 908 votes in favor and 408 votes against. Uh, that there was a total of 1,570 residents who voted in that election. Uh, that is 17% of our total voter checklist that, uh, for 2019. So now it's 2023 uh, and Brattleboro has patiently waited. And I'm very grateful, as I said, that we're, we're bringing this back uh, up and that hopefully we can uh, approve it this time. Um, I want to speak to the committee as a uh, municipal leader uh, in this town that I hear um, often from residents in Brattleboro, um, both youth and not youth, uh, who want to know when our charter change is going to go into effect. Um, and I, um, you know, explain to them um, at, as quickly as I can on the street um, the the concept of Dillon rule and that this is something that's in the, in uh, the legislative level and that we are um, waiting to hear what Montpelier's decision will be about our charter change. And so I want to really um, emphasize to this committee uh, that this is still something that's on the minds of Brattleboro residents um, and is something that they still uh, want. So I, I also wanna speak briefly to why um, this charter change matters to me. Uh, and why I support it personally. Um, we here on the local level are talking more and more about issues that are relevant and will directly impact the youth in Brattleboro. I've been on the Brattleboro Select Board for four years. I, this is my uh, second year as chair. Um, and I have come to see that we are uh, talking more about climate change, energy decisions for the town, inclusivity, uh, engagement, outreach, these are things that uh, matter to all residents, but are going to have uh, a uh, larger impact on our youth than on uh, the older residents in our town because they theoretically will live here longer. So um, I think it's very important that uh, we uh, give those uh, members of our community who are uh, youths uh, a voice in those decisions that are being made. Um, Further, I believe uh, as, a, as someone, I'm, I'm born, uh, I'm, I'm from um, Essex, Vermont, up uh, in Chittenden County and uh, have been down in Brattleboro for uh, five years. But just as a, uh, someone who lives here, who lives in Vermont, who, who cares about Vermont's future, I believe that we as a state have a vested interest in retaining as many of our youth as is possible. Uh, and that that is important for both the health of our state and, and our future as a state. Um, and it's clear that allowing more civic engagement for our younger residents can only help in achieving that long-term goal of retention. If we want to retain our youth, we must create a conditions of belonging and trust uh, in our communities across the state. And I believe that this bill will help to achieve that. Um, that's kind of the end of my prepared remarks. I wanna just take a moment to uh, speak to the Senator's question um, about the um, numbers. And then I, I wanna just take a moment to rebut another um, argument that I heard on the House side. Um, so first for the numbers, I, we got that question, um, how, many, how many actual 16 and 17 year olds are gonna vote, uh, basically, if, if we approve this in Brattleboro. Uh, and I was totally 
with, I had nothing. I had no idea how many it would be. So in the interim from testifying on the house uh, side to now, I, I reached out to my town clerk and then also to the um, uh, school district to try to get some numbers. And it's not as straightforward as you would think to get an accurate picture, but I'm gonna try my very best and I'll explain to you sort of how we got there. So um, there are um, a total of a, a approximately 469 um, uh, 16 and 17 year olds at uh, Brattleboro Memorial High School. Uh, that number is made up of half of the 10th grade class, half of the 12th grade class, and all of the 11th grade class. The idea being that 10th grade is 15 and 16 year olds, 11th grade is gonna have 16 and 17 year olds, and 12th grade will have 17 and 18 year olds. So again, it's approximate. Uh, and then um, of those 469, there are people who are, um, uh, or, or, or youth um, students who are not from Brattleboro. So some of them are from Dummerston, some of them are from Guilford, um, Vernon, because we are uh, a hub town, we, we, uh, for, um, which is great, we get students from multiple communities, but they would not be registered voters in Brattleboro. So the 469 is high, uh, it probably should be lower. Um, and then uh, I went to the town clerk and um, it's, we have 9,650 registered voters in the town currently. That's of not 16 and 17 year olds, that's 18 and up. Um, Brattleboro has approximately 12,500 uh, residents, approximately. Uh, and so that's approximately 77% uh, uh, of registered voters to the population. Now, some of the 12,500 are younger people. So that's a little bit off as well. But I think that the committee would pretty reasonably say that you're south of 361 registered voters um, of the 16 to 17 year old range band should you um, approve this. That's taking the 469 total, which, would in, which is currently including uh, other students. So it's, it's probably more realistically, maybe like 235. Okay, wow. Um, do you have all that math written down? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> so it does seem like you had some written testimony that you were reading from or for your first part of your testimony. Yes? Or Correct. Okay, if you, might, if you might add some of that, the, num the math um, to the end of your testimony, uh, that would be helpful and send it along to Olivia Parker, our committee assistant. That would be great just to have for reference um, when when we report the spill <clears throat> before and, and talk with our colleagues about it. Yeah, I can definitely do that. I think, but what's more important to me than getting really down into the nitty gritties because a lot of this is approximate calculations based on numbers that I was asking and pleading for uh, and people were having a hard time giving me exact numbers is that you're you're not looking at more like it's, 300, it would be a very, um, uh, you know, 300 uh, re new registered voters would be a high number. So you're right. south of that for sure. <laughs> right, absolutely. Um, all right, and did you want to rebut something about that was said in the house? You had mentioned that as well. Yeah, I just want to, I, I don't know if it's spoken to yet or not, but um, so one of the sort of fatal elements of the first round uh, that the legislator had on this petition was the issue of um, a 16 or 17 year old Brattleboro Select Board member being able okay. to um, be an element of a contractual agreement that was signed by the town uh, as one of the five members of our select board. And I think I just wanted to make sure that this, the committee was aware that uh, it's been essentially determined by your own legislative, legislative council that they, they're, that we, we're basically, in my understanding is that you're, um, you know, you're executing a contract as a body 
and not as an individual. And so the fact that a, a 16 or 17 year old is one of those five members does not attack the validity of that contractual agreement that, um, that as a select board member, you execute them all the time. So uh, it's definitely part of it, but um, yeah. And then I think the other one I wanted to just speak to briefly was just um, this concept of youth being informed or youth having the capacity to understand finances. That's something else I heard quite a bit on the house side. Um, and I think the, the, the quick rebuttal to the, in, in, are youth informed enough is my Lord, if we held a, um, uh, a requirement for voters to be informed, uh, we would have to exclude a lot of other voters that weren't just uh, 16 and 17 year olds, but um, many people vote who are maybe not informed enough. And that's not something that we can hold as a standard mm -hmm. for ability to vote. Uh, and then the other one is about uh, an ability to, um, uh, Rep Higley asked about, uh, or not, yes, Rep Higley asked, asked about uh, the uh, youth capacity to understand finances. And um, I would just really urge the committee to remember that we in this country ask 17 year olds and 18 year olds and 16 year olds uh, to start thinking and then eventually making a really important financial decision when it comes to whether they're gonna go to college or not. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I am 31. Uh, I have friends who are still um, suffering sufferings may be a little bit of a harsh word, are still experiencing the repercussions of a decision they made as a 17 year old when it came to finances. So um, it's not really up, it's not really a question as to whether 17, 16 and 17 year olds understand finances. It's more of a reality that our country is asking them and making them uh, have to. So I don't think that that should weigh heavily on your decision as to whether to support Brattleboro voters in this initiative. And I apologize for taking so much time. I'm done. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. Thank you, Mr. Goodnow. And in fact, just to underscore your first point, we did hear from our legislative council on that, um, that there is a section in the bill, section 2.1 on page four of the bill, a youth voter who is elected to a town office shall be capable of performing all duties and exercising all powers of that office, including the formation and ex execution of contracts relating to the office or official duties. So the, 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 the charter was amended here to um, make sure that it was entirely clear that if, if a 16 or 17 year old were to be elected to the board, they would have all the powers and duties of that office. So, um, uh, and I just uh, want to underscore, I, another point you made is that last year when, um, we took this bill up in the Senate. I, I happened to be at that very time, the mother of a 16 year old and a 17 year old just to happened to fall right at the perfect time when their birthdays um, uh, were, you know, were, uh, and they were 16 and 17 year old. And I, I, can, I remember on the floor assuring everybody that my 16 and 17 year old both would be able to understand <clears throat> everything they were voting on and that they were entirely engaged citizens and more engaged and more informed than many, many other citizens who have the right to vote and have the right to serve in public office. I, I myself have served with many, many people in public office and uh, not all of them are well informed. So um, I, I, I definitely uh, agree with you that 16 and 17 year olds are given a lot of responsibilities and rise to the occasion. And this would just be uh, another thing that would continue to help them be active and inform citizens because they were given the right to vote. So I appreciate that as well. Um, are there other questions for Mr. Goodnell? Um, well, thank you, Ian, for your time today. We really appreciate it. And if you could send your written testimony um, to Olivia and Lily, if you're still on there, I saw you pop up, but if you are still there, if you could also send your written testimony to Olivia, that would be helpful. I she think did, I oh, really did. You just did, actually. Thank you very much. We're much right. appreciated. And thanks again for your time. Um, uh, thank you again, Ian. Um, we're going to hear from Representative Molly Burke at this point, and um, we will keep you posted. <laughs> thank you. Oh, 
Mm. Wait, I have a post it to a client. Oh, okay. Uh, Olivia, would you be kind of to email the folks assistant master? We're still on time, and if she still wants me to, I can. Um, thank you, Molly, for Representative Burke, for being here. Um, if you want to introduce yourself for the record and then uh, tell us your thoughts on this amendment or this charter change, that'd be great. Representative Molly Burke of Brattleboro. And um, Madam Chair, thank you for having me and members of the committee. Thank you. Um, I think that you heard some very excellent testimony from mm -hmm. representative, uh, good representation of our of our town. Um, I this this has been going on for a long time. That actually was not mentioned, but in 2015, this vote failed in the in the town. And then there were some. I couldn't remember exactly. There were some little uh, glitches around signatures, et cetera, to get it back on the ballot. But then, as you heard, it came back on the ballot in 2019 and was voted on with uh, 908 to 408. So I think during that time, when it failed and it passed, I think that the, the young people did a lot of work. I can remember being at the polls, and I don't remember whether it was for a, um, a primary or for the general election. I think it was for primary. And they were there at the polls talking to people and interviewing them and explaining to them why this was important. So there was a lot of work done by a previous um, group from Brattleboro High School. And I expect they're probably, you know, <coughs> going away. So, um, and I think, you know, the other, the other uh, thing to consider as, as thinking about this we are a very old state, as we all know, and Brattleboro, this county, I think, is considered the oldest county. And so if we, and it was stated before, I think in other ways, if we want our young people to be engaged and to think about staying, we need to sort of welcome them into the community in this way. Uh, there are a lot of, in, I know my granddaughter is a, a junior, high school junior, she's on the student council. There are a lot of students who are very engaged in, in many different issues in our town. Um, so I don't really think I have anything else to add to the testimony that was already spoken. I just want to say that that uh, both Lily, Lily was, you know, obviously very accomplished and uh, very well spoken. And I think her experience as a page was, was really sort of points out how <laughs> Django is an outstanding uh, performer, member of the Sandglass family, uh, performing group, performing family, and uh, he's he's been very, very engaged in out here for the Youth Climate Day a couple of years ago. Uh, so I think that they that they're they're not unusual. In there in the town, there are other students up there. So I think that really that's all I have to say. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, that's our way. Uh, thank you, Chair Hardy. So Brattleboro has been through the ringer with the legislative process with this. Well, you, yeah, and then people are like being said, you know, when is this going to happen? Yes. And so, uh, so I'm wondering if you could give that perspective, like your, I. So I kind of think about this in two ways. We've got the actual concept that you're changing in the charter. And then we've got the idea that you're a community that is coming to us with a charter recommendation in general. And how do we treat charter changes as a state? And we're in Dillon's rule state, all of that. But I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to what it's been like to be a town that has had to just continually come to the state to ask for something that you voted on as a community. Well, it's been hard to be a representative because people are like, why isn't this happening? You know, what are why what are you not doing? Yeah. You know, um, so that's you know, that's sort of what um what I've gotten periodically like over the you know, the four years that, yeah. since this passed. So do you think that that has led to any <clears throat> like do you think it how has, has it changed how Brattleboro has related to the state at all? Or do you feel like there's any concerns on that front? I, for me, when I think about what the role of the town is as it relates to what the role of the state is, is I lean philosophically more towards permissibility of towns um, versus 
state oversight. I like local control. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to the local control aspect of this. Well, a couple of years ago, um, our select board came to us and asked us, I will remember the, the legislation, um, asking for some leeway in, I can't remember specifically, in um, municipal affairs. Mm. And this came to us from a select board that was you know, getting a little frustrated with some of the, the limitations. So, uh, but that um, sort of did not happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that now there's a new charter committee form because we have to revise our charter. So, uh, you know, I think it's, 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 it's an issue that I hear in select board meetings periodically. Well, you know, because we're Dillon's real estate or we're feeling a little bit um, hampered yeah. The state. I think uh, a couple of people brought up in um, House GovOps, we should sort of really consider the will of the town yeah. in, in looking at these charter changes. Mm -hmm. I don't think everybody feels that way, but yeah. you know that's the way of, of thinking about it. If the town voted on this by an overwhelming majority, it's going to affect the town. It's not going to affect yes. the state particularly. You know, if all of a sudden, you know, there are 250 16 and 17 year olds voting, um, and they're, you know, voting for something that all of a sudden, we're going, oh my gosh, we made a terrible mistake. You know, I don't think that's going to happen um, because I, I think that people won't take that seriously. But it, it would affect the town, mm -hmm. and it would, but it will also affect the town in a positive way. I oh. think, you know, we are really, um, I, you know, I live in a neighborhood. Kids grew up in the neighborhood. Kids were all out in the street playing all the time. Nobody's moved. There are no kids. Mm. There are no, and you go through many neighborhoods in Brazil. And I mean, there are obviously kids in school. There are schools. But the population has definitely, of children, has definitely gone down. So I think that, you know, if we can, you know, there are other things we can do, like a good child care bill to bring bring more families into the law, things like that. But I think this this gives a message to students that they're important, you're valued, you want your voice. We want you to touch the Exactly. Thank you. So. Well, thank you very much for presenting this work. Um, we are going to move, I think we're going to have Tucker come up and, yep. and testify. Um, we have a lot of charters to get to. So. And I appreciate your time. And you took a yeah. lot of time on this. So thank you. Well, yeah, my, our pleasure. Thank you very much for being with us today. Over several years we've taken yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, it's been a long haul. It's been a long yeah. haul. <laughs> and not for your, if anyone in Brattleboro is watching, not for lack of the representatives. Yeah. Or my, my, my other Brattleboro representatives, yeah. we have done a trio of. Yeah. Of which, yeah. Well, we are we're going to have Tucker up just to make sure there aren't any other questions from the committee on the language. Um, and uh, have we have uh, paper copies that you were given last week? I think when we went through this bill, we walked through the bill, um, and Tucker answered questions that point and I remember the new language on um, the authority of the elected voter youth voter um is that that's the only change from last year correct was that added provision that is correct to clarify it okay are there any other questions for Tucker about the language um it is also on our website if you don't have it Senator Bihoski I don't have a question for Tucker but at one point we were going to hear an amendment on this are we no longer doing that or did we hear it and am I just forgetting um, oh, so a Senator Chittenden has an amendment um, that would change the charter. Mm -hmm. And so I asked him about it and asked if he intended it to be a floor amendment because it would make significant changes to the charter. Mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, we as a committee first need to do our work. Mm -hmm. And if another senator from another committee wants to come to us with an amendment after we've decided what to do with the bill, then they can do that. But first, our committee. Um, so if there are amendments from our committee, that, that's um, that's legit right now. But we're going to wait to hear from Senator Chittman. Maybe he has to take it before the voters in Brown. Um, are there questions or um, concerns of ch uh, changes or anything in the language? OK, if not, then I 
you don't have to stay unless you want to. I, you're here for our next uh, one. Wait, okay. can I ask a um, general is, question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Center like how many do you have a sense of how many charters we approve versus disprove as the legislature and is there like a historical trend on you know how many we it could here i'll just tell you what my assumption is my thing we approve most charters almost all of them 98 percent like 98 percent what is there a trend in typically what the ones we don't approve is a lot or we maybe not us as a legislature but don't become law so um, primarily, and this has been true even before my time, mm. like when I was onboarded by Betsy Ann Rask, who used to handle this portfolio, um, charters or provisions of charters that are facially unconstitutional typically do not survive the legislative process. And this would not be an example of that. Correct. Okay. That makes sense. So it's very rare to have a charter that is not deemed unconstitutional to not become. Yeah. Uh, one other example of a charter that might not survive is one that doesn't meet the procedural standards um, set out in statute. And this did. And there's been one charter in my time. Uh, it was a comprehensive revision and it was presented as a single uh, ballot question of do you approve the charter amendments oh, but, the but the language was very substantive and contained you know 10 to 15 new expansive powers for the legislative body of the municipality <clears throat> including federally preempted management of airspace over the town Whoa. um and when it landed pun intended <laughs> in house government operations and they looked at how it was warned and presented to the voters that committee decided that it was almost intentionally misleading the voters and they didn't understand what they were approving and that it needed to go back for another vote and that flight was canceled and the town declined <laughs> to put it back to another vote so okay thank you that's um, that's very helpful just wanted to make sure that my assumptions were relatively correct uh, oh, right. Um, and in all fairness, the charters that have challenges are the ones that present issues that we would debate if they were in other bills. Totally. The, you know, the Burlington one with the firearm uh, safety okay. measure. I mean, the, in, so in all fairness, other, other issues that we find just generally thornier issues yeah. are the ones that tend to be barriers to charter passage. Yeah, it seems like we've non-citizens, age, and guns have really been the three. Yeah, those have been the three. Well, so, and and I, I will right. also add, to be fair, that, I mean, we made, we, the House made an amendment to this and strengthened it. I think in that, I, I know that, that we're going to hear another charter, I think, tomorrow that the House did a significant amount of work on to approve the language. Um, so, um, and I I appreciate the process yeah. actually of oh. having. I think that we should do this. I am happy we are a dual state and think. Oh, we oh, I'm doing yeah. <laughs> so. Um, no, I think it's but very important. we are gonna we have other charters. So unless there's more discussion on this specific charter, I would entertain a motion. I would move we uh, vote out favorably the so Brattleboro Charter H four eighty six. Yeah, before. 386. I mean 386. Yes. 386 is another one all together. Okay. So there's been a motion. Is there a discussion? Senator White. Madam Chair, we typically allow a bill to kind of sit for a bit. Has this bill sat yes. with us for long? Yes. Enough? We we went over it last week, uh, Wednesday of okay. last week. So it's been over a week. Okay, and thanks for joining my um uh, I don't remember all of it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's simmered for a while. Um so we have a motion on the table. Is there further discussion? Okay, clerk, would you call? 386. <clears throat> Senator Vahovsky. Yes. Senator Wood. Yes. Senator Norris. No. Senator Watts. Yes. Senator Clarkson. Yes. Chair Hardy. Yes. And the reporter? I will report this one. <clears throat> uh, I thought that was going to be a tussle between you and Becca, between the youth vote and the mother of youth vote. Yeah, I, I think oh, we yeah. chair uh, bills. Okay, so great. <laughs> and given Bob, did history, you vote no? I voted no, yes. Thanks, Molly. Thank you. You want to know why again? I really yeah. appreciate it. Oh. Yeah. But, you're welcome. Um, okay, we're going to move. Nice to visit. Thank you, Molly. It's good to see you.
Um, <clears throat> yeah, yes, Bob, but not you. I'm staying until the house. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, when are they going back? Okay. All right. Um, we are moving on to H488. And we have Representative Logan Nickel with us. And 488. Um, we <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah. answers. Yes. I do want here, but maybe not at this moment. Not this moment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we did hear, we did go through this last week. Um, a representative Nicola, would you like to come join us at the table? Um, we we're supposed to have another witness who is not has not joined us, so we'll have to see about that. But. Um, this is the charter change for the town of Ludlow. Mm -hmm. um, you have not been in here so we'll yet this year, right? So no. we'll introduce ourselves just to make sure you know who we are. I'm yes. Senator Ruth Hardy from the Addison District. Oh, hey, Rebecca White, Windsor County District. Bob North, Franklin District. And Hudson, Washington District. And Allison Carson. Windsor County Windsor District, County. just in yeah. one. Okay. Um, so, could you, well, introduce yourself and yeah. then tell us obviously who you are here, but also what your relationship is with the town of Ludlow? Uh, so, uh, Logan Nicole, a uh, representative from uh, Rutland Windsor District, Ludlow, Mount Holly, and Shrewsbury. Uh, Ludlow is my hometown. Okay. Uh, so, I grew up there. I was on the select board for Five years. Okay, so you were, but you're here. not currently. On the I'm not currently. Okay, on that was the thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did not. I was there when we talked about putting this proposal in. Uh, this was um, the original idea was something that the I think for a long time the select board didn't know that they didn't have this ability, <laughs> um, and so they. Uh, realized that they we had gotten a new town manager just at the end of my time in the select board, and he was, you know, not he, you know, said that they would need to put in a charter to be able to give themselves this uh, for the for the select board to have this power, um, and so that's what you know brought us to this point. They had tried to there was some confusion. They tried to do it at a town meeting because they didn't realize that charters needed to be voted Australian ballots. And then they did it Australian ballot that following November. Um, and yeah. So they they don't have an actual charter. This is the first thing that they're putting in the town. Yeah, we technically right? have a village. <clears throat> and so the village has a very extensive charter. Okay. Um, but yeah, the town itself did not have a charter, does not have a charter. I am also, you know, somewhat in the process of lobbying to uh, merge the town and the village. So I think, you know, long term, we will need to adopt that village charter as a town charter because it sets up our municipal sewer and water system mm -hmm. and our uh, electric light department. But okay. that's a whole other right. issue for another time. Okay. Well, one of the questions I had was this language. Of, do you have it in front of you? Uh, what number? Is yeah. it again? 488. 488. I have it. And it's The Flood Board shall be vested with the sole authority as to warning town meeting articles by floor vote or by the Australian ballot system of voting. It, the, the language seems awkward to me, first of all. And then it also sounds like they can decide what's going to be a floor vote, what's going to be an Australian vote, and yeah. kind of go back and forth. So, uh, yes, I mean, the intent right. is that, yeah, right now we, we still have a town meeting. We still vote everything on the floor, uh -huh. except for um, elections and uh, uh, school budgets. Uh -huh. um, but uh, and so the select board would just, they want the ability to give, to send things to Australian ballot that they feel like they want more people to weigh in on, uh, that they feel are, I think the issue kind of first came up around, I forget what the issue was <clears throat> now. I think it may have been around, 
No, I'm not remembering. Okay. It, was, it was just after my time on the select board. I wanted to say it was something to do with the, the marijuana dispensary, but we we passed that bill to make that Australian ballot anyway. <laughs> That's, so, I'll be on the floor vote. But there was a, there was a big issue in town, and this basically the select board really wanted. They thought that it should go to Australian ballot. It, I think it was to do with um, the school actually, because the school closed. And so then there was a decision whether the school building, the town should purchase the school building from the district for a dollar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that kind That's of right. thing we set up in, uh, I think it was in 46. Um, and the select board thought that that should be voted by Australian ballot, but because we still vote everything on the floor, it had to be voted on the floor. Right. And they, they just thought that town meeting is good and we get, Decent attendance. We love our town meeting. We love our process. We get a stronger vote turnout for Australian ballot, and they would just wanted to be able to send it to Australian ballot. But isn't it? I, I mean, this question for our legal counsel. But usually, a town, and I know that um, Ashley's done a little research for us on this question. But a town has to decide: these are the things that are going to be Australian ballot, and these are the things that are going to be. Um, uh, floor vote, and th those are votes of the people to determine to go from floor votes to Australian votes. You can't just kind of swap back and forth at the will whim of the select board. Yeah, I mean, currently that's the point of the trial. I think, yeah, no, that may be more a question for Tucker, but yeah, basically, in in when we set something up, I know uh, we kind of sometimes decide that it needs to be voted either Australian ballot or, you know, can still be voted for, like things that come directly from the legislature. But in general, uh, my understanding is that you either need to have a floor vote or you need to vote everything by Australian ballot. And so you can't just change as you choose. And so that's, that was- the, They wanna be able to change as they the choose. Select board. I, my concern with that though, <clears throat> is that the select board would be like, oh, well, here's the thing we want low voter turnout for because we yeah. want this to pass. And here's the thing we would rather have high voter turnout and they can game it. Um, so it, it that's the way it's written. It, it seems to suggest there could be, and, and I'm not, I'm, yeah. I don't want to accuse anybody of that. I'm not saying that that's what their intent is to game it, yeah. but it, 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 there could be um, in some future time the, you know, a select board that does try to game it. And that's my concern, especially if you're maybe coming up with a, a major issue like uh, merging a town with your village. And, yeah. and I would yeah. want to make sure that there's very clear rules so that it wouldn't be gamed. And so that is my particular concern and would love to talk with our legislative council about how we clarify this language. Because I think... Yeah. You know, I, I want to. I understand the town wants flexibility, but I think there needs to be guide, guide, you know, parameters around that flexibility. Yeah. Um, we also tried to invite somebody, your town manager. Yeah, Bernie McNamara. I don't know him super well. He's uh, relatively new. Our town manager uh, resigned. We had a town manager recently resign and became town manager in Manchester. Yeah. Um, and he so, said he was new and didn't really know much about it, and then we. He, he he's not he hasn't come he hasn't shown yeah. up on zoom so i don't know if there's somebody else you might suggest that we is there a select board chair that uh the select board chair recently resigned oh, too. oh no oh, Mo, oh, we've had a lot of changeover yeah. the past couple well, of months you, i thought you were still on the select board it turns out you're not no i haven't been for five years yeah okay. what? yeah um yeah. well Okay. Well, you're yeah, probably, for the town, so I'm we'll probably go with you the then. closest <laughs> to an elected official at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think. Um, I guess my only comment would just be that we're. I I I see the concern, and I I do. I think that is a concern. Yeah. I think my perspective is just that I, I we have, I. I have trust in my select board to make those decisions. And I think that that's, you know, it's kind of where I think the town was too, is just that we trust the select board and we elect, you know, we obviously we vote for the select board. And so we trust them to, to make those decisions and choose that. And the alternative as it stands right now is just that everything has to be voted by, by floor vote. Yeah. 
And somebody fairly recently made a motion to, you know, to change everything to Australian ballot, and it was defeated. Anecdotally, I can say it was, you know, it was by voice vote, but there it was. 190-ish people to about two. So they there was just a vote to change everything to Australian ballot. I think not this past failed. town meeting, but the town meeting before. Okay. But this would give the authority to the select board to make everything an Australian ballot if they wanted to, because they could choose. Yeah, the issues they could, that they, they felt. Overrule the, the will of the voters in that case. Well, the town also supported yes, this Yes, you're right. And it was, it, according to yeah. my notes, it was 50% turnout because it was an Australian ballot, which is much, much higher than some of the other ones we've seen. Um, so there is that. Um, but what, are there other questions for Representative Nicole? I'm sorry, I mispronounced your name at the beginning. It's Nicole. Nicole. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, thank you, Chair Hardy. Uh, so one of the things that interests me about this change in relation to Ludlow is that you're very unique in the fact that you have a lot of out-of-state folks who live in the town who don't necessarily, uh, they may consider, they may be full-time at some point, but they're not now. You know, they're second homeowners mm -hmm. or they reside part of the year. And I'm wondering if you have any understanding of the floor vote and people who might be seasonal to full time but vote in town mm -hmm. and if any of the demographics of your community are the reason behind why you're kind of in this in-between space between the two if that had any impact on why you would want this flexibility yeah i don't know i don't i don't know that that's i would say mm -hmm. that anecdotally i know that most of the people that go to the, you know, it's hard to know. Yeah. Like, yeah, obviously, that would involve knowing what, how people voted. Yes. Uh, you know, not on the floor vote, mm -hmm. the Australian ballots. And so I, I, I don't know for sure. I would say that most of the people that I talked to um, and engaged with at town meeting, they were very supportive of this proposal and they, they thought that it was a good idea. The select board really liked the idea because, you know, again, I, I, I've hesitated to say this because I feel like it's it puts us in a weird position, but the select board, while I was on the select board, just didn't know that this wasn't a thing. And so <laughs> kind of would do it. Oh. And I came in as a select board member who had no experience outside of this own board. And so when an issue seemed like it was like a big issue, we would just say, oh, that should be, that we should put that on straight now. Oh, more people. Less and there was a town manager who, had no formal training as a town manager. Yeah. And so that was, you know, just, mm -hmm. you know, a body with no outside of town. <clears throat> and it's just a small town. And so, you know, during my time, our town manager resigned. We, you know, went through a process. We hired a new town manager and he was like, you can't do that. <laughs> You're not allowed to do that. And so that's where this all came about. Uh -huh. came about. But that's where it, it feels like all the people that I know that are very engaged in the community are very supportive. But that is something that yeah, I don't know exactly if there are people that I would consider full time residents that are registered to vote and may vote absentee. I don't think we have a very large absentee contingency, okay. but okay. I, I guess that's a possibility. Okay, yeah, I just I was wondering, I was like, oh, well, maybe it's yeah. a thing where you would do that if you knew you would have folks who are absentee voting, yeah, because they're gone. For Not that I'm aware like, of, per se, but, thank but you. it's definitely, I mean, that's another, yeah, possibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, are there other questions for Representative Nicole? Okay, I think you're welcome to stick around. But we're going to yeah. hear from yeah. Ashley um, and <clears throat> Tucker to uh, figure this out. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, because it's really the word "sole authority" that are the stickers, mm. right? Well, and the sort of ability to go back and forth. I think and the ability to yeah, go. Back. So, and, and that language is. So actually, oh, okay. after we looked at this charter last week, I'd asked you to do a little research and you did, and you emailed it to me. Um, did you actually never asked you to send it to Olivia? Oh, I, um, I can send that to Olivia. Yeah, could you send it to her now, what you wrote, and then maybe you can post it and send it to the committee. Um, so, and if you wanna take us through what, your, what you found out, that would be helpful. 
Yeah, go ahead. My pleasure. Um, my name is Ashley Angel. I'm a law clerk for the Office of Legislative Council. Um, I did some research regarding um, the background of select board's ability to either vote by floor vote or Australian ballot. Um, so the authority for select boards to establish town meeting articles through floor vote or by Australian ballot was created in response to the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. It was an emergency. It was an emergency provision, right? Um, in Act Number 162 of 2020, any municipality had the ability to apply the Australian ballot system to any or all of its municipal meetings held in the year 2021 or uh, by vote of its legislative body, notwithstanding the provisions of 17 BSA 2680A and 16 BSA 711E. Um, 2680A is the, the Australian ballot provision that I talked about last last week, I believe it was, um, where it kind of gives you guidance as to what you can use Australian ballot for and mm -hmm. all that, like with public meetings or questions or um, um, budgets, etc. Mm -hmm. um, it's okay. You finish and then we'll go to questions. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, and then uh, next in. Uh, Act 77 of 2022, uh, uh, this, uh, this act allowed for municipalities to apply the Australian ballot system to its annual municipal meeting held in 2022 by a vote of its legislative body. Any such vote could also apply the Australian ballot method of voting to any vote that occurs as a result of the annual meeting. And then this year, Act number one, uh, this continues to allow for municipalities to apply the Australian ballot system to its annual municipal meeting by vote of its legislative body. The act allows for municipal legislative bodies to vote um, to apply the Australian ballot system to the annual or special meeting until July 1st, 2024. Um, so yeah. basically what this bill would do is essentially give the town the permanent flexibility that was in um, the temporary provisions that we approved during COVID, correct? So that they could decide, oh, that we're going to do Australian ballot or 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 vote. Would this um, Ashley or Tucker give them the ability to say these are things that we're going to do by floor vote and these are things we're going to do by Australian yeah. vote and do it at the same election? Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Are there questions for us? Um, Senator Behosti. Yes. Um, so one of the provisions that I remember discussing pretty regularly as we had these conversations last biennium was that you could not vote to adopt Australian ballot by Australian ballot. Is that <laughs> correct? <laughs> Ashley or Tucker. Uh. <laughs> 17 BSA 2680 subsection E states that a municipality cannot use Australian ballot at the same meeting where Australian ballot is approved by the voters. So it is not <coughs> an express prohibition on using Australian ballot to pose the question, but it means that's the only thing the voters can vote on at that meeting if you do put it, uh, put the question on Australian ballot. So in the context of the temporary authority that you all put out there, it was a binary option for the legislative body. If it was in the judgment of the legislative body too dangerous to hold a floor vote with everyone together, they could switch the meeting to the Australian ballot system and mail out ballots. A um, little different than the Ludlow context, which allows the warning of individual issues. And the problem with that temporary authority is that if you were going to switch to Australian ballot for the meeting, you couldn't then ask the voters at that meeting, because you're using Australian ballot, uh, if they want to do that indefinitely. That was the issue. That mm -hmm. came up. Because then the only question at the annual meeting would be, would you like to use the Australian ballot system of voting? So this particular vote that occurred by Australian ballot procedurally is acceptable? Yes. Okay, thank you. Senator, I saw someone over here, Clarkson Watson, Norris, Senator Norris. <laughs> you know, but for me, are we aware of any other townships that had the same provision as applied for this? Underhill. <laughs> <laughs> Underhill had that? 
How long is Underhill out there? Uh, I wanted it to be for a while. A while. Okay, I, yeah, I couldn't find the year when I was looking at this. Is it the same language, the sole authority kind of language? It's, it's, not? it's slightly different, but it generally said the same thing from what I remember. Yeah. There's one clause that's important in the Underhill language that Ashley found, and that's that it leads in with a clause that says, except as otherwise required by the law. Which means that when statute tells a municipality that they must use Australian ballot, Underhill would not be able to deviate from that. Okay. Because they are directed to use Australian ballot by law, but where there's discretionary authority, where floor votes could be used or Australian ballot could be used, Underhill has charter authority to designate Australian ballot for those particular questions. And when does law require an Australian ballot? Great example would be charter amendment procedure, which requires <laughs> expressly that the question be put to Australian ballot as the rep representative uh, mentioned earlier. Okay, okay. Uh, Senator Clarkson, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I, I did. Uh, um, I was thinking maybe Underhill would have done this, but they did. Um, but what Underhill did, that additional language might be useful for us. Uh, the, where I thought you were going, Ruth, was with identifying which kinds of votes they could do, use which type of voting. Uh, I thought maybe that's where you were going with that. And I was saying one thing we could do, depending on how people are feeling, is articulate which types of votes they, they could use, they could make them. <clears throat> yeah. Well, yeah, I was thinking of that, and I mean, it, it my concern about what, what Representative Nichols said was that they might be going to a merger, which would require a town charter change, so, um, um, and a village charter change, so I just don't want, I just want to make sure there's not the ability to game it, and, uh, you know, I, I'm not suggesting that the Ludlow Select Board would be doing that, but we have heard of Select Boards doing questionable things sometimes and we want to just make sure that there's not this uh, this ability for them to say well on this thing we're going to do this and whatever to to get the outcome of the vote that, they, that the select board wants rather than the voters want um so i don't know if either of you have suggestions or want to think about that language that might be and maybe i do like that unless otherwise provided by law because that would I just cover too. the charter changes um, but there may be other things. I, I am concerned with the sole authority uh, in there. And um, yeah. we don't have to vote this out today. We can come back to it tomorrow if people want to think about it a little bit more. Yeah, and I'd love Tucker and Ashley if you want to think about it. Um, cool. Is that yeah. uh, um, Senator Clarkson? No, I'd, I'd love to see the, the underhill language too, just so we okay. can look at it. All right, well, let's let this, we'll mull. We're going to come back to it tomorrow because I know it'd be nice to get it out. We're not trying to delay it, but I just want to. Um, okay, thanks, Ashley. And um, we do have other charters that we want to get to, um, especially ones that need to go to money committees. Um, so we are going to move on. Thank, Thank you, Logan. Thanks, Thank Ashley. Thank you. Thanks, Logan. Thank you. Good to see you. Um, good to see you. We are always unencumbered today, so I'm missing all your four, three We're ladies. We're going to move yeah. to, to H 489, which is the charter change for the town of Shelburne. And we have Lee Crone with us, the town manager of Shelburne. Lee, thanks for being with us today. Um, we are going to introduce ourselves, and then you can um, <clears throat> tell us. Oh, we also need the bill. This is and, and we have a stack of them right now. Okay, that's great. We have a fiscal now. Sorry. So. Um, so I am Senator Ruth Hardy. I'm uh, the chair of the GovOps committee, and I represent the Addison District. Uh, I'm going to be a part of the committee. Tom Rubino, Ski, Shetland Central. Uh, Rebecca White, Windsor County District. Bob Norris, Franklin District. And Watson, Washington District. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County District. Great. Why don't you introduce yourself, Mr. Crone, and then um, go ahead and tell us a little bit of history about this charter change. Thank you. My name is Lee Crone. I'm the town manager here in the town of Shelburne. And as you're aware, we have hopefully proposed a bill that would be a charter change to allow the town to adopt a local option tax on sales, meals, rooms, and alcohol. The town of Shelburne is in a strange place. It's kind of like a teenager growing up. It 
It has a full service set of municipal responsibilities, but not an enormous tax base to support it. We're facing some significant capital needs in the foreseeable future. So we have done lots of research on this. We're aware that at least two dozen other municipalities have similar enactments in place. And we are hopeful that the legislature will see its way to approve this as well. In terms of how those funds would be used, the select board has adopted a policy at my suggestion that would limit the nature of the uses of any prospective local option tax proceeds, primarily for capital needs, debt reduction, energy efficiency, land conservation. We're not looking at this as another way to raise more money for the general operations of the town, really looking to dedicate it to the more significant capital needs the town is facing. Great. Um, Can I thank just ask you to repeat the four? Uh, let's go ahead, Senator Clarkson. Yeah, could you just, uh, would you be kind enough to repeat the four? It's capital needs, energy efficiency, land conservation, and? And a debt reduction That's or it, repairs or other emergency needs related to a declared disaster. Right. You, I knew you had one other because I had some other notes in our first conversation was, yeah, repairs for other emergency needs. Thanks. Um, are there other questions for Mr. Crone at this point? Um, I do. Just, yeah, go ahead. The total person. revenue that you're expected, we have a, a joint fiscal note, which only represents some of the, you know, the part the state gets. What are you hoping to see in this annually? Because uh, what's the town hoping to gain? Thank you. We have a finance committee with some financial experts who've done considerable research with the great help of the state's tax department. It's estimated that a local option tax could reap as much as a million dollars each year, which of course, roughly 300,000 of that would flow to the state for its own pilot program. Right. So it appears okay. to be a potentially significant revenue stream for the town and the state. Okay, we're, we're, I know the committee went over this on Tuesday when I was yes. here. So, um, are there other, were there any concerns that were raised at the time when you went over it um, at procedures or anything like that? This is all procedurally okay, Tucker? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the vote was actually not, it was it was tighter than some of the other charter changes. What was the vote? The vote was 838 to 593, only 20.8% again, low, low tur turnout. And it was at town meeting and, um, I, I, my comment, <clears throat> my comment was I was I was surprised you weren't a gold town. I was surprised you couldn't just do this. Well, I was surprised too. But my not. past life, I served with the town of Manchester for many years. So I'm very familiar ah. with gold town status, and uh, we were one of the first at that time to consider adopting this, and it was an enormous emotional debate. It was certainly debated here at length. We held quite a few public meetings beyond the two required public hearings to try to vet this thoroughly for everyone's benefit. Oh, that's that's good to know. That's terrific. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Did you have a question, Senator Okay. okay. All right, well, thank you so much for your, your time today, Mr. <clears throat> um, it's just good to have somebody from the town to come and speak to it in case we have any questions. Um, but we are gonna actually take a vote on this now because uh, this needs to make a stop at another committee and we're running out of time in the legislative session, so. Um, I um, thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your consideration and we look forward to hopeful passage. Yes, right. we, we like your mural in the back wall. Thank you, I inherited that when I took office here. I believe it was a mural from some school children and as a former teacher myself, I was certainly not about to remove it. No, yeah. it's, it's charming. It's nice. charming. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Thank um, I would entertain a motion on this one. I would move that we vote out favorably uh, H49, the Shelburne Charter. Okay. Is there any discussion? All right, the clerk, you want Senator to- Senator Gavahovsky. Yes, I suppose so. Senator White. Yes. Senator Norris. Yes. Senator Watson. Yes. Senator Clarkson. Yes. Chair Hardy. Yes. 
despite my hatred of local option taxes, I will support the town of Shelburne. Um, okay. Um, who would you like? like so we're going to have another um, I'm happy. charter. You want to do them both, the Shelburne and Rutland? Sure. Uh, it's I'm happy to do that. Okay. Um, As a civil so, raisin meeting. Okay. Thanks so much, Mr. Crone. We're going to move on to our, we, we just voted out of this committee. So one more stop down the hall. Thank you very um, much. Over six zip. Here you go. All right, we're going to move along yeah. to the charter of the town, the city of Rutland. Um, and oh, we may have to have a special delegate report this one. Out. Um, can we have alumni from our committee report it? Okay. He loves to do it. Um, See, I'm okay. Is there a safe word anywhere? Right on. here in front of me. Right. Okay. <laughs> this. Um, <laughs> Wait, this is different language than we just saw. It is. Rutland? It's the same. It's, it's the not. Rutland and the Shelburne language is different. Shelburne utilized St. Albans. Yes, they St. Albans use. language. That seems to be the language lots of people like, but Rutland is different. And the actual local option tax that is being assessed is, is different, different than Shelburne. Okay. okay. Um, Where is it now that I have? <laughs> Any Middlebury. Okay. Is there um Tucker? Just so I am since I wasn't here on Tuesday, is there anything materially different between these two? I mean, they're different language. <clears throat> one first. Oh, I see. There's one is yeah. there are two <laughs> substantive you. material differences. The okay. first is that Rutland is only proposing a local option tax on sales. Okay. They have not adopted their LOT for meals and alcoholic beverages or rooms. The second is that uh, if you go to the end of section 8.9, they are dedicating the revenue from the local option tax to specified purposes. So they're actually enumerating the ways that uh, the city will be able to use these, these funds. Well, the underfunded could be a charter pension. trap, but they, they have the opportunity in the future to hold a town vote to suspend that charter provision. Okay. But okay. yes, this is an ACBAR provision. Sure. Got it. Okay. That <laughs> is helpful to know. It, um, it, it's interesting, and it's, it, it's interesting. I wish we just had one more check because Shelburne, Lee just told us very specifically what their expectation is of how they're going to use it, but they didn't put it in statute, which I think is much wiser because you actually never know what you may actually need it for. And you can have certain purposes, but this is very prescriptive. The 15 second rundown of how that has happened is that in the past, a lot of charter provisions specified where the revenue was going to go to, both to kind of negotiate with the voters, but also to negotiate with some of the money committees that would be reviewing the charter provisions. And there's been a movement away from that because it's typically better for municipalities to put the local option tax revenue into their general fund and spend it as they would like to. Um, and then sometimes municipalities pitch these local option taxes and tie them to specific infrastructure projects. They're not looking for a local option tax for an indefinite period. The most recent example is the town of Montgomery that adopted a local option tax to pay their funding match for federal funds they were receiving to uh, update their um, sewer and water systems in the town. And their charter provision is going to last probably for 30 years while they pay for this mm -hmm. upgrade and then it will go away. Okay. Senator Watson. Um, I just want to say I could I could picture there being reasons why you would want to include the those um, uh, the what you're going to be dedicating it towards. Um, but instead of speculating, I think we should just hear from Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Tucker. Um, so we have with us, um, I'm sorry that you guys have this. Um, Is this our new mayor? Mike Dungies. I'm sorry if I've said that wrong. So why don't you uh, pronounce your name for us? Sure. Uh, for the record, Mike Dungies, Rutland City Mayor. How's that? 
Yes, Dennis. Okay, thank you, Mayor. It's nice to see you. Um, I am Senator Ruth Hardy from the Addison District. We're just going to introduce ourselves. Uh, Hi. Senator Tanya Vihovsky, Chittenden Central. Hi, Rebecca White, Windsor County District. <clears throat> Bob North, Franklin District. Ann Watson, Washington District. Allison Clarkson, the other side of Route 4, Windsor County District. <laughs> Yeah. That is who we are, and we now know who you are. Welcome to the Senate Government Operations Committee. And why don't you give us the history? You heard a, a little bit of our conversation about the use of the funds. If, why don't you give you a little bit of history on this? And 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 yeah, go ahead. Right. So I was actually uh, on the Board of Aldermen at the time uh, that we wanted to put the 1% option to. So last year, prior to being mayor. Um, and you know the discussion um, around why we dedicated the use. Um, right now, there's historically there's been some challenges with ensuring that the voters are represented well uh, when we're planning budgets and how we're doing projects. And there's a lot of long-term visioning. And, and and when you think about the way that Rutland does our budget, the mayor dictates the budget and then the board can only strike from the budget. Um, so the, the board wanted to take the opportunity to say, look, future planning is really important to us, which is why if you look at the three things we chose, right? Capital improvement planning, um, a couple of other things uh, from, a, sorry, somebody's literally outside my window waving at me. So if I seem distracted, that's why. Um, but <clears throat> capital improvement planning, um, Funding the underfunded pension, right? So as our as you know the market changes, our pension, you know, can can appear uh, underfunded. It's actually been consistently underfunded for the past fifteen years. So we want to fill we want to fill that gap. We still want to pay for that out of the budget, you know, funding our pension out of the budget. But we want to fill the gap so that we're we're not playing catch up all the time. And then the last one is for specific projects. So uh, if I remember correctly, so being able to do that gives us some longer term planning and. and uh, as was stated earlier, you know, the ability to change that in the future would be great. Um, we can always send that back to the voters. But if we're doing something in one of those three veins, the Board of Aldermen can determine uh, what percentages will go to each one of those funds. So it really gives us some boundaries uh, for those funds so that we can use them appropriately. And they don't just go to pay down the tax rate arbitrarily or go to, you know, things that the voters didn't necessarily care about. So we wanted to give them the option. Any questions on that? Um, well, thank you for that background. Are there any questions after that conversation we had? Um, okay, it, so, it seems like you mm, answered like, the question. Oh, Senator Clarkson. Mike, uh, well, congratulations on your election. And um, how much revenue, what's your anticipated revenue for this? So um, originally, we were looking at, you know, we were expecting after the state keeps their 30% or so, we were expecting about 1.2 million. But the report that came out um, the financial report that came out from the state uh, predicts that the state will keep about six hundred and eighty thousand dollars. Yeah, six hundred thirty of it going to um, our pilot or the pilot fund, and then the remaining balance going toward the administration, which is great. That tells us mm -hmm. that it might be significantly more, but maybe you know a much higher number. So, yeah, no, I it, it, I was going to say because we're anticipating that thirty percent is six eighty five. Yeah, that's really yeah. good. So we're excited about that. Um, we're excited to see that, you know, we always try to do things a little conservatively down here in Rutland. Uh, so, so hopefully our conservative estimates uh, result in a, in a better, in a better um, revenue stream uh, uh, from the option tax. So. Great. Um, well, for, I, I think the committee went over this on Tuesday, but can you tell me how, what the vote was? Sure, I got those numbers knowing that you would probably ask. So um, 3,065 uh, 3, people voted in the March election here in Rutland. Um, that's out of 11,882 registered voters. Um, so- Sorry, how many registered uh, voters? 11,882 11, registered voters. Of those 11,882, 3,065 voted. Of those 3,065, uh, 1,729 voted for the option tax and 1,216 voted against. Right, that's what we have. Okay. And we had it being about 25%, again, pretty modest. 
for t- turnout for town meeting. Yeah, we and we there was a huge push down here, and it was still a modest turnout uh, for town meeting day. So yeah, and yeah, we'd love to yeah. see that much higher. Much yeah, we're this is, we're seeing this. It's not just you, so um, but statewide, we need to do better on these local turnout, local vote election turnout. Um, are there any other questions for the mayor at this moment? Okay, great. Um, thank you, Mayor Dungies. Um, and uh, we're gonna probably vote this out right now if you want to stay and watch. I'd like to hang. Is that cool? Great, thank you. Um, excellent. You guys okay? Were you doing some math? We're doing math? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, right. so they they're guessing you're going to make two point. Their revenue is going to be two point eight three. So do we have a the, whole, the whole, not right, the whole, right? Yeah, the whole, yeah, the whole thing. thing. Okay. And then Got six it. thirty. I'll get back to you, Mike. I'll get back. To you. <laughs> yeah. Still pretty good. Though. Total two point total. Okay, excellent. Um, is there a motion? I would move. That we pass out favorably uh, H505 Rutland uh, City's charter change, char- charter amendment. Okay. Uh, there's been a motion. Is there further discussion? Okay. Clerk, you want to call the roll? Senator Pahovsky. Yes. Senator White. <laughs> yes. Senator Norris. Yep. Senator Watson. Yes. Senator Clarkson. Yes. Chair Hardy. Yes. Okay. Um, so Senator Clarkson is going to report both of those. Thank you, Mayor. It's, it was nice to meet you. Um, I'm not sure. Nice to meet uh, you, too. I, Thank you for having me. Have a great day, everybody. Good afternoon. Okay, everybody. We are going to take a break until um, 3.15, which is when we're going to go over the House proposal of amendment on S-17, which is our the sheriff bill. So 